The Commonwealth is a voluntary association of 54 independent states, working together towards shared goals of democracy, development and peace. Member countries span six continents and oceans, from Africa to Asia, the Americas, the Caribbean, Europe and the South Pacific. The Commonwealth is seen as a special family, a family of nations. In the Eastern Caribbean, the Commonwealth of Dominica is located between the French islands of Guadeloupe and Martinique. A member of the Commonwealth since 1978, Dominica is the youngest island of the Lesser Antilles. It is distinguished by its lush rainforests, rare flora and fauna, and the world's second largest boiling lake. On Sunday, November 3rd, 1493, Christopher Columbus sighted the island of Waitikubuli and rechristened it Das Dominica, meaning the Day of Our Lord. The island was occupied by the indigenous Kalinago people and had been populated by indigenous Amerindians for over 2,000 years. The first European settlers were the French from 1635. The British followed in 1761 when they captured the island and in 1763 formally occupied it by the terms of the Treaty of Paris. Very early they established a House of Assembly based on the British Westminster system and in 1765 constructed a building which has for the most part been the site of the Parliament of Dominica up to the present. With a population of about 70,000, the Nature Island, as it is popularly called, is one of the Caribbean's few republics. We had what was the format for most of the British Caribbean in the 18th and early 19th century, which was a House of Representatives voted for by the people. Of course, in those days, uh, you had to be a white male up until 1832 in Dominica. Uh, to be able to qualify. Not only did you have to be a white male, but you had to be a Protestant. The Roman Catholics were only emancipated in 1829, and immediately afterwards, about two or three Roman Catholics were elected to the House. Now, this is ironic because the majority of Dominicans were and still are Roman Catholics. Eventually, uh, the Parliament uh, because of all of the problems that were occurring in the 19th century throughout the Caribbean, the rebellion in Jamaica, for instance, and others, the British government wanted to uh, basically turn these islands into full crown colony with totally nominated members, uh, supervised by a council which was chosen, of course, by the governor. So everybody would be in favor of the state. Um, and Dominica got into this position in 1896 when essentially the House of Assembly abolished itself because the British government said we are not going to give you any aid, we are not going to help you with your debts unless you decide to vote yourself out of office, which they did and therefore for something like uh, 29 years Dominica had no elected government at all. Uh, it was strictly a council nominated by the Crown. After the First World War, a group of very nationalistic Dominicans started to protest and say, look, no representation, you know, no uh, taxation without representation, and uh, we deserve to be able to run our own affairs. And so this eventually happened in 1924. A new constitution was given to Dominica. For the first time, women could vote, but uh, men or women had to have qualifications to vote. They had to earn enough money, have enough wages, or own property to a certain value to be able to qualify to vote. And that continued until 1951, when all qualifications that were required to vote were abolished, and anyone over the age of 21 could qualify to vote. And then eventually in 1974, that age was uh, reduced to 18. What also happened was gradually, and this was a British pattern in the 20th century, that you uh, basically gave more and more self-government. You increased during the 1930s and 40s the number of elected members. In 1951, you uh, allowed the vast uh, majority to vote. 
And so uh, what happened in from 1956, you had ministries that were put in place. Uh, and then in 1961, further constitutional changes took place. And then the big leap, Dominica and a number of other uh, territories which are now members of the OECS, uh, they were granted what was called associated statehood with Britain. And this meant that they were responsible entirely for their internal affairs, that Britain would only be responsible for defense and foreign affairs, and that the rest, uh, budgetary considerations, everything, would be managed by Dominicans. And that lasted for just over 10 years, because by 1976, Dominica began to put forward the case for full independence. Uh, on the 3rd of November, independence, full independence, political independence, uh, was granted to Dominica. And that was under the new independence constitution. And since that time, that is the constitution that we have followed. When we first, uh, in 1976, began the process of going towards independence, uh, we were basically faced with a draft constitution, which was essentially the same as most of the other independent states at the time in the British Caribbean. We were going to become a monarchy. The Queen of England was going to be the head of state, represented by a governor general. There was going to be a, uh, two, two chambers, the Senate and the lower house. Uh, and essentially the pattern of that constitution was really basically the same that had been handed out to places like Barbados and Grenada and the others. And uh, we decided, I say we because I was a member of the House of Assembly at that time and I was one of the opposition delegates uh, at the constitutional conference that was held in, in London. We went to a preliminary conference in March and then the full conference in May, but the negotiations continued on because there was this difference of opinion between the government and the opposition about the manner uh, and the constitution that we were going to go into. So eventually what came out of it in all of this discussion was that we would become a republic. Governed as a parliamentary democracy, the president is the head of state and executive power rests with the cabinet headed by the prime minister. So that was how we went into independence. The president is essentially uh, has certain responsibilities. He or she is the guardian of the constitution. They want to ensure that uh, everything is running according to the constitution, fair, uh, and that also is responsible for uh, appointing certain commissions. For instance, the electoral commission that's responsible for boundaries and running of elections, the public service commission, for the civil service and also the police uh, service commission. And so the president acts as a sort of father or mother of the nation if you want. So uh, the political parties can come and go, the president and the position of the president remains a respected independent position. The president under our constitution is elected by the members of the House of Assembly. Any two members of the House of Assembly can nominate someone to go up for president. Generally what happens is the leader of the opposition and the prime minister agree on someone who is so outstanding and so respected that really there is very little controversy about their position. The president serves uh, a five-year term. Now uh, if, uh, if uh, he wants to or if uh, conditions are favorable in that regard, he can serve two five-year terms. Um, but that's the limit. So therefore, the, the, the prime minister can continue as long as he is elected, as in the British system, but the president has a limit of two five-year terms. The prime minister is head of government as opposed to head of state. And uh, in the pattern that we follow, you would have a general election, the majority within the house, the prime minister is chosen by the president as the individual who commands the support of the majority of members of the House of Assembly. We must understand that our constitution, when you read it, says very little, if nothing at all, about parties. It's all about individuals, because at the end of the day, the majority party is decided by those individuals who support the person who is going to be chosen as the prime minister. The current prime minister is the Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt. 
sworn into office in January 2004 after the death of Pierre Charles, he has been a member of parliament for the Via Cass constituency for 10 years. Apart from being the Prime Minister, he also serves as Minister of Finance, Minister of Foreign Affairs and political leader of the Dominica Labour Party. Upon taking office, he became the world's youngest head of government. When I was elected or suggested by some of my colleagues that I should, I should become the Prime Minister, it was, um, a, 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 a surprise to me because I had only been in, in Parliament for about three years, uh, my first time being in Parliament. And I felt there were other uh, much more senior members of the party in Parliament um, and they should have been the ones um, considered. But the, the majority of the colleagues felt that I should be the one and um, I was catapulted into this position. It wasn't a position I, I thought of before or I wanted before. Um, so it was a, a, a very interesting time. And, uh, but we took on the responsibilities and decided that we had to consolidate um, the situation in the country, having lost two prime ministers in quick succession, and um, to put the country on a strong footing and also the party on a strong footing, recognizing that elections would have had to be held within a year's time. Um, so there was not much time to, to really reminisce on, on, on that particular period, because we were in the middle of a, an IMF um, program, um, an austerity program. So you have that issue of the economy and also the issue of preparing the party um, for uh, general elections and recognizing that we were an IMF program which was not a very popular uh, um, enterprise in itself um, was a very interesting time. Uh, but looking back I, I believe that we were able to consolidate uh, both the economy and also the party's opportunities and, 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 and chances um, in the election which followed. Dominica has a unicameral parliament consisting of a 32-member House of Assembly. 21 members are elected for a five-year term. Nine members are senators appointed by the president, five on the advice of the prime minister, and four on the advice of the leader of the opposition. There have been some benefits to having the unicameral system. It has worked for us. Um, people are, every member of parliament is treated as an equal, whether you are elected or you are, or you are um, nominated, appointed. And, 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 and we have seen good, good discussions taking place. So it, it has worked for us and we believe that it, it, it allows for efficiency. It allows for greater um, camaraderie among um, elected and, 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 and um, appointed people. Um, and it saves tremendous sums of money. Um, for the state itself. The presiding officer of the House of Assembly is the Speaker and is elected by members after an election. The current Speaker, Alex Boyd Knights, is a Dominican politician and attorney. First elected in April 2000, she was elected to her third term in February 2010, making her the longest serving Speaker in Dominica's history. I'm the third. Um, Mary Davis Peel served as speaker. Um, she was the first woman speaker probably in the region. And then the second was um, Mrs. Um, Neva Edwards. She was the second, so I'm the third. The leader of the opposition is the member of parliament who leads the official opposition in the House of Assembly. The current leader of the opposition is Hector John of the United Workers' Party. First elected as an MP in 2009, he was sworn in as opposition leader in 2010 and is the youngest to hold that position. It is an honour and a privilege to be serving in such a capacity at my age. Um, but it comes with challenges. Um, the United Workers' Party gave me that opportunity to serve at this level. Um, in July of last year after the by-election and I see it as an honor and a privilege to serve but it started um, somewhere I would say by at the age of 13 for my in my community as a um, community organizer being involved in youth groups playing sports and being part of the community being community oriented so you have that natural progression growth and went away to to further uh, my studies, came back in August of 2009, ran in December, won my seat. Uh, my seat was made vacant 
by the leader, by the speaker of the house. Um, and we, keep, we had by election in my constituency and the constituency of the former Prime Minister, Honorable Edison James, and we won our seats by um, greater margins. And I got the opportunity for the United Workers Party to serve at this level. And as, as I said, it has its challenges and it's getting more and more challenging, but I'm up to the challenge and so far, so good. I have to learn fast and further, not only learn fast, but the support around me is tremendous. And that is what gives you the energy to move on every day. And being that young, doesn't mean I cannot serve at that, in that capacity and uh, I must say it's an honor and uh, continue to grow. The opposition holds three of the 21 seats in the House of Assembly. Hector John has joined the UWP boycott of the House in protest against alleged election irregularities. We decided to boycott the House on four simple grounds on the electoral reforms. We are, we are asking for ID cards, cleaning of the list access to the national radio station. We had no access to the national radio station. And also enforcing our bribery laws. Um, these are four simple things we were asking for. Even the chief elections officer, in uh, her report for the election of 2009, she made these recommendations as well. So we, uh, that's what we were asking for. That's why we stayed out of parliament. Well, the workings of Parliament have not been affected as such. But I, I, I hold a very strong view that government has its side and the opposition is there to present an alternate view. Now, with them, them not being there to permit the public to hear that alternate view, I think the public is being shortchanged. We've been criticized for saying that we're moving to a one-party state because we would like to win all 21 seats. I'm not aware of any political party anywhere in the world who would not want to win all seats available. If not, we would not have, have filed 21 candidates. Um, and in a way, the people vote for, for people. And the people of Dominica decided that they wanted to give this party and myself a, a stronger mandate in the parliament because we came from 12 seats to, to 18 seats. And, and because they were appreciative of what the government and the party have been doing for the people of Dominica. And there's, there's no in, interest in the government to have a one-party state. And as a matter of fact, in the present situation and our constitution, there's no way any, any person or group of persons can cause there to be a one-party state in Dominica. There are too many checks and balances in this constitution for it to happen. With a two-thirds majority and an opposition absent from the House, how does the government of Dominica conduct its affairs? Importantly, too, is that we circulate the draft bills or amendments to existing bills um, to the Bar Association and to the various stakeholders. I would like to make this very important point in respect to the two thirds majority and the, 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 the talk that now the government has more than two thirds majority, we can go to Parliament and amend the Constitution. Now, within the Constitution, there are areas where you would need to go for a referendum to have the Constitution amended. And there are others where the, 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 the government side can impose its two-thirds majority on the parliament to amend the constitution. And I have given a firm commitment to people Dominica that this government, um, as long as I'm the leader of the, of, the, of the country, will not go to parliament to amend the constitution without widespread consultation to people in Dominica. In the House of Assembly, Speaker Alex Boyd-Knight is seeking to leave her mark. My number one priority is to, and hopefully that happens before I limit office, is to get the Creole language part of the proceedings. Currently, the standing orders say that you can only speak English. So when members speak Creole, they are forced to have to translate it because it's not going to be recorded in the Hansard. Now, I, I, I am very um, concerned about that. Um, I think Creole is our, part of our culture, it's accepted, we, we do lots of things and for the highest institution in the land to say that Creole is not good enough, I really take umbrage on, on, on that point. And so <clears throat> that is one of my beliefs. I happen to know that in Seychelles, not only do they speak Creole, but it is recorded in Hansard, as does St. Lucia. 
I have been convinced from what I know about St. Lucia and even Trinidad, the demeanor and um, the, the, the attitude of members um, change because they are aware it's not only the sound that's, that, that, that's going through, but the, 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 you're actually seeing what these members are, are, are doing, you know? So that, that is happening now. Most, uh, from, since the, the last election, the entire proceedings are being brought live. At the governmental level, the Prime Minister says there are a number of priorities, including education, agriculture, water resources and ecotourism. One of the major priority areas for us is our continuous thrust in education. Um, that is very critical. When we came into office, um, governments before us had made some progress, but we believe that we should have been further in terms of our education advancement and, and, and having our people gain access to, to, to greater education opportunities. In 2005, we implemented um, universal um, access to secondary education. And we, in 2002, we uh, consolidated the tertiary level institutions in Dominica uh, to create what is now the Dominica State College. And as a result, have caused more of our, our young people to have access to, to, to community level, community college level education, associate degrees and, and, and um, advanced level um, examination um, um, programs too. Uh, but we have also seen more of our students having access to, to university education. I mean, at present, for, for example, we have uh, about 90 students studying various disciplines um, in China. Um, and it's an interesting place to study uh, because our students are, the tuition is in Mandarin, the Chinese language. We already have students who have graduated and who are back and, and speak in Mandarin. Some of them are in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Some of them are working in the Ministry of um, Public Works. And now we have um, several projects funded by the Chinese. They are able to better uh, relate to the Chinese contractors in terms of the language and, and, and also serve as um, translators and interpreters for the government officials. We have set our goal in respect to education that by 2015, we should have at least one university graduate in every single home in Dominica. It is a very ambitious um, goal, but we're doing everything possible, making the resources available for that to happen. The other major area is in geothermal. Um, we have a consortium of, of parties uh, working on this geothermal exploration. We have the European Union, we have the French government, depart the departments of France, Martinique and Guadeloupe. And we also have um, interest coming from Venezuela. Um, the United States of America has shown an interest in, in also funding aspects of it. Um, you know, so we're working with a large consortium of, 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 um, of countries and, and institutions towards the exploration. What this will do for us is, one, is that it will cause us to be self-sufficient in respect to energy um, um, generation in Dominica. So we would rely less on the importation of, of um, diesel and other petroleum products. But very importantly too, we would have the capacity, based on studies that have been done, um, we would have the capacity to export energy to Martinique and Gordon. And that's where the French government and the European Union and the French departments come in. And, and that's where the, the main interest is there, is the, our ability and capacity to be able to export um, our energy to these countries. And this would certainly help our economy tre tremendously. The other area is agriculture, of course. Um, Dominica is known for its um, fertile soil and the, and the climatic conditions for agriculture. We continue to expand these areas. Um, there are challenges in terms of, of transportation, which we're seeking to work on because we are, in fact, exporting agricultural produce to, to many of the, of the other countries within the Caribbean um, community. Uh, from Guadeloupe in the north to all the way to St. Thomas and St. Croix, um, St. Martin, the BVI, and, um, and St. Kitts. Uh, we export agricultural produce there. We, we do some to Trinidad and, and Barbados, uh, Martinique. So, so we have the capacity to, of course, to, uh, to, to the UK. Uh, but the, UK, the transportation link to the UK is, is in place. Uh, but for the region, we need to improve on that particular aspect of it. Last year, as you recall, there was a major drought in every single CARICOM country, um, even including Guyana had some challenges there. Um, Trinidad and St. Lucia was the major challenges in Barbados. But there's still a major water challenge in many CARICOM countries because of the demands um, by tourism and the demands by, the in, by industry. 
and um, the water resources, the access to water in this country is are very limited. And Dominica is well placed to supply the whole of CARICOM with water on a daily basis. And I believe uh, what CARICOM needs to do and we continue to do is to put this on the CARICOM agenda. Because water is becoming a major um, international um, topic for discussion. You know, it's going to be a very important resource in the next few years. It is already a major issue. In respect to tourism, um, and more particularly ecotourism, we're making some tremendous strides in there. We have seen improvements in, in, in um, our tourism for us over the years. And with the improvement um, to our air access situation, because that was a problem before, our airport closed at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Now that we have um, night landing in place and we've already started receiving night flights, uh, we've already seen the impact of the night landing facilities on tourism uh, arrival, tourist arrivals, and, and therefore the impact on the economy. Prime Minister Skerritt is also committed to CARICOM integration and describes his vision to take Dominica forward in this way. Our economy needs to be, needs to be more independent and, and to be more resilient and, and where all people can live a, a fulfilling life. Um, you know, and, and everybody uh, could have access to the resources they require to, 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 to make themselves and their family comfortable. Um, you know, so this is why we're working very heavily on the, on the water resources and the geothermal because we believe these two areas can certainly assist us in creating that greater economic independence and, and to cause our economy to be, to, be, to, to be less vulnerable to external shocks. Dominica, moving forward as a parliamentary democracy.